one rounds into it, and I'm just burning off the clock right now to get going on uh, this next set. So it looks like this thing is not going. All right, 24 seconds in. <clears throat> All right, so like I said, I was going to be posting more, uh, you know, workouts, stuff that pertains to, you know, physical, mental, spiritual stuff. So uh, this workout, like I said, it's every minute on the minute. Um, and right now I'm just doing three pull-ups and 10 push-ups. Every minute on the minute. I'm 31 rounds into it, which means I've done 310 uh, push-ups and 93 pull-ups so far. So about to hit this next set and, uh, I got about 20 seconds of work and then 40 seconds off so I can talk in between. So yeah, if you're just tuning in, I'm just doing a push-up, pull-up workout every minute on the minute. Um, 32 minutes into it now, so at uh, 320 push-ups and 96 pull-ups, and I'm just going to be using this clock for now. Typically, I use an app called Tabata. You can get it for like 99 cents on the App Store. Let me check my time here real quick. I might be a little off on this one. Um, but yeah, you can get an app called Tabata for like 99 cents on the app store. It's great. Um, this is a great little routine, right? Push-ups, pull-ups, uh, putting them together. You can get a lot of work done in a little amount of time. I was originally planning on just doing 30 minutes, uh, which would have been uh, roughly, uh, what would that be? 300 push-ups and 90 pull-ups. And I probably would knock out the last 10 pull-ups just to have a nice, you know, even number. Um, I think I got a little off track here, so I better hit this next set. Um, you know what? I'll just wait till this clock gets to the next minute. So I got about seven seconds here. We'll keep this thing going. And so uh, we'll just keep rolling. If you guys have any questions you want to throw in the chat, just let me know. Like I said, it's just like 20 seconds of work, 40 seconds off. I am by no means in incredible shape right now. In fact, I took off basically like a month of training because of just so much travel going on. Seven, eight, nine, boom. 33 sets. Okay. So I'm at 33 sets right now. Yeah. So I'm not in great shape right now. Um, if you're in phenomenal shape, better shape than me, which I'm sure a lot of you that are planning on going to buds are right now. Um, you just up the numbers. So instead of just three pull-ups, uh, every minute on the minute, maybe you do four, five, six, seven. Uh, not that long ago, I was doing seven pull-ups every minute on the minute. I do a 30 minute workout like that. That's 210 pull-ups. I believe it is in a, a very short amount of time which is pretty good. And uh, this stuff just helps make SEAL training a whole lot easier when you get there. To be honest with you, I've never seen anyone quit because they couldn't do enough pull-ups or enough push-ups, right? Guys, don't ring the bell over this stuff. Most important stuff is your running and swimming. Uh, but this stuff makes your running and swimming a lot easier. And what I mean by that, if you can get through a buds push-up, pull-up workout, like all the calisthenics, and it doesn't hurt as bad as it does for some other guys because you put in the prior work. Um, a lot of guys are going to be suffering a whole lot longer than you are going to be. They're always going to make you suffer in buds. They're going to get you there. But not everybody suffers as long as the other person, right? Um, there's some workouts that are going to be relatively easy for you in buds, and it's going to make other guys suffer. And so you can consider that suffering zone, call it the red zone. You want to spend as little time in that red zone as possible. You will get to that red zone. Um, but some guys, it's, it's like, oh, so, oh, so like they, they spend their entire time at Bud's in that red zone. And there's other guys that just have to touch it every now and then. And that's how you want to spend your time in Bud's. So if you go there not prepared, you can't really do a whole lot of pull-ups and push-ups. You can do the minimums. Yeah, you're not going to quit. You're not going to ring the bell over that. What happens is those pull-ups and push-ups will beat you down so much that by the time you get into the arena where things do get difficult, like on a run or on a swim, now you're already behind the curve. You're already behind, whereas these guys that were very well prepared, it's like that calisthenic workout was, was nothing to them. They're going into that run fresh. 
And so that's why it's pretty important still to, to keep up on these push-ups and pull-ups. Even though nobody quits on them, uh, the better that you get at it, the easier it makes your runs and swims. That's the way to look at it, really. Don't worry about whether or not you're going to quit on a Bud's grinder workout. Hardly ever happens. I mean, they're def- everyone's got to ring that bell at that grinder. Eight. So it's about 20 seconds of work, 40 seconds off, which is kind of nice. If you guys have any questions or comments, let me see if I can kind of scroll through here. You know what's already happened is uh, I lost track of where I'm at. I tuned in at already 31 cents done. I think I've probably knocked out four since then. So it's called 35. It might be 36, but I'm not going to give myself that. So I'm at 35 sets so far, which would be 350 push-ups. And then 35 times three, 105 pull-ups. All right, time to hit another set. So these, uh, every minute on the minute workouts, man, they're great. They don't kill you. You're just building up volume, right? You know, like if I, if I keep going, two, if I keep going to like the 50 minute mark, which I guess I'm at the 36 right now. I mean, think about how many pull-ups you've accumulated in push-ups. So to get to the 50, that'd be 500 push-ups, right? 150 pull-ups. That's pretty good for a 34-year-old that's not in the greatest shape anymore. <laughs> um, but you should be striving for more, for better. And so what you do is you sustain a certain number. Like, let's just say maybe you can only do two pull-ups and five push-ups. Would you ever consider private military contract as a Christian? Um, I've already made my decision on that. It's no, I have no problem with it in in terms of Christianity. The reason I wouldn't do private contracting is because I made a promise to my family that I wouldn't do that. And the reason I made that promise is because, you know, we went through some stuff as a family because of private contracting. My mentor, Scott Helvenston, is one of the uh, private contractors and, Fallujah back in 2004, uh, who was ambushed and killed. And so uh, I promised my family while I was in the teams, like, you know, when I get out, I'll never do that. You know, that's for their sake. Uh, But I don't see any conflict with being a Christian and a private contractor. So that's a comment I just saw go by. Uh, What set am I on, guys? Help me out. I forget. Did I just do 36? I think I did 36. I just got this lame little analog clock that I'm going off of. I normally like to use the um, that app I was talking about, the Tabata, because uh, that keeps track for me. Time to do it again. So these are just good grinding workouts. If you're getting ready to go to Buds, it's all about body weight exercises. And it's all about being able to grind. Your initial focus is to get a good PST, you know, have a good number of push-ups and pull-ups you could do, run, swim, all that, for that short little workout. But if all you focus on is that, then you're not going to be good at the long game. And the long game is buds. It's every day, all day, just grinding push-ups, pull-ups, all the different little, you know, four-count, five-count exercises, running, swimming, just grinding. And so that's where these workouts really come into play. And here's another great thing about body weight exercises and doing these. Like, I'll, I'll come back to that question. I didn't get to read it all the way, but I got to hit this. This is a slow grinding workout. All right, see if I can see that comment. What was the reason why you left the seals? Politics are just a spark. No, it wasn't any of those. It's a good question. So why did I leave the seals? I got saved March 14, 2007. Had a radical conversion to Christianity. And it was like that day I knew that I'm not going to make a career 
of being a SEAL, which was my original <laughs> plans. You know, once I got in and made it, it's like, yeah, hey, I made it. I realized that I want to be in a different army. Still want to finish this time as a SEAL, but I want to be a part of God's army because in the SEAL team, we're fighting for freedom. We're fighting for freedom that is temporal. That's a good thing, man. We're fighting for human life. But on the spiritual side of things, if you do believe in God, you do believe in eternity, you do believe that there's more beyond just this temporal life, right? Then suddenly you see a battle that's more significant. It's one thing to fight for temporal freedom. What if you could fight for eternal freedom? What if the things that you do really do echo in eternity? And that's what I realized spiritually is that there's people that are in captivity, uh, to spiritual captivity, spiritual slavery, and they don't even realize it. Uh, I was that way, you know, for 23 years and I got saved, not because of anything great that I did. It's because I realized what Jesus did at the cross and being saved, being forgiven of my sin. I felt so compelled to, I want to share this with other people. And I saw that as a way more important mission than any other mission in life. In fact, that's the mission that we've been given by Jesus. Bible uses all kinds of military parallels. So Jesus being the commander, he's commissioned us, which is a duty. That's a task, right? To do what? To go and advance his kingdom. So we fight for a temporal kingdom here on earth, but you can fight for an eternal kingdom, spiritually speaking. And the weapons that you have, it's a weaponized message. It's the gospel message. And it overthrows the plans of the ultimate terrorist. You know, a suicide bomber, they strap on a vest, right? And uh, obviously they know they're going down. What is their intention? Well, they want to take out as many people with them as they possibly can in the process. That's what a suicide bomber is trying to do. Now think about Satan. He's like that suicide bomber, man. He's strapped. He knows he's going down. We've read the back of the book. He's going to that lake of fire. Uh, but he's not content with just that. What does he want? He wants to take out as many people with them as he possibly can. All right? That's your family members. That's your coworkers. That's your friends. But God has given you a mission, just like a Navy SEAL, to give you a weapon. It's that weaponized message. It's the gospel. It's the power of God into salvation. So that's why I got out in SEAL teams. And uh, that's what I've been up to ever since I got out. I didn't get out immediately. I got saved March 14, 2007. I didn't get out till May of 2010. I finished the time that I had left. Any other questions in there? If you guys are just tuning in, you can always go back live. Um, I mean, go back after this is done. It'll, it'll stay up. But I'm doing a, uh, a push-up and pull-up routine every minute on the minute. That's what E-M-O-M means. I bet most of you know that. I'm only doing three pull-ups and 10 push-ups. But that adds up. I'm like north of 35 sets so far. Definitely far north of that. I think once I get to the 20 minute mark on this stream, I'm 14 minutes into it right now, I'll have 50 sets. And so by the end of that, it's 500 push-ups, 150 pull-ups, which is good. It's good for uh, a guy like me. And if you could do that, then do four pull-ups every minute on the minute or five pull-ups every minute on the minute. How to get back on the fitness horse after a month off. That's exactly where I'm at right now. I've been off for a month, pretty much ever since uh, November 10th. So just under a month. So this is how I'm doing it. Do this every minute on the minute workout. All right, these pull-ups and push-ups. Every minute on the minute. It's a good grind. Make your goal to do like 30 minutes, right? Do 30 minutes every minute on the minute. And uh, I don't know where you're at fitness level, but pick a number that you could do. Maybe it's only one pull-up and five push-ups every minute on the minute. When you do that for 30 minutes, you got 30 pull-ups and 150 push-ups. That's a good start. And then if you can get through that, no problem. 
you know, up the numbers, right? So I'm only doing three pull-ups right now and 10 push-ups. You know, when I was in good shape, I was doing seven pull-ups and 15 push-ups every minute on the minute. You might be wondering, like, how often can you do something like this? I think you could do it virtually every day. I just did 120 pull-ups yesterday. Let me go back to that comment. I have 30 seconds. How do you give everything that came? Sorry, this comment's fading away. I don't know if it's because my hand's wet or what. I can't scroll. And I got... 10 seconds. I got it. Oh, that's a good question, that last one. So if any of the guys that were hostile towards my faith and the SEAL teams, have any of them become Christians? Yes. One of the guys that used to give me the hardest time And not like super evil, just like he was ribbing a lot. He was the one that would kind of stir up some people and, uh, you know, kind of call me out in front of everybody, make fun of it. That guy became a Christian. And it's funny because it's like, hey, did you hear? So-and-so became a Christian. I'm like, that guy, really? They're like, yeah, man, he's one of those, like, got to convert everybody now kind of Christians. I'm like, that's so funny. That's exactly how I was, you know, when I was in the teams. And so the irony of that. You know, sometimes the people that that make the biggest noise about you being a Christian are the ones you're really touching the most. And, uh, you know, there's a saying, when you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, how do you know, how do you know which dog got hit by the rock? That's easy. It's the one that yelps the loudest. And isn't it true? In terms of Christianity and sharing your faith, sometimes when you're you know, throwing that seed out there, you're throwing those gospel grenades. How do you know who got hit by it? Well, I think a lot of times it's the people that are making the most noise about it afterwards. You might think that they're really irritated, repulsed, and turned off to it, when in reality, you're touching a nerve. And it's good that they're feeling that, right? They'd be scared if they didn't feel anything at all. All right, these are adding up now. I think I got two more sets to get to 50. But we'll call it three more just to be just to be safe. My hands are getting free. Turn up now. So if I get to 50, that'd be good. A little volley of push-ups. All right, any other questions? No cardio? No, absolutely I do cardio. This is cardio. <laughs> um, yesterday I spent like, I think like close to an hour and a half on a bike. I did uh, like 25 miles on the bike. I try to keep it 20 miles an hour. Can you post a Murph workout? Yeah, I'll have to do that sometime. I have to find a way to like, you know, maybe have someone follow on the run with like a bike or something like that. If you, you drive an 18-wheeler, all right. So this guy says, look, I, I drive an 18-wheeler. I'm so out of shape. That's the life on the road, right? And I can sympathize with that because this is how I get out of shape. I get a bunch of trips coming up that are stringed together. Like November it was insane. I had like 10 trips that I did. And so much of that was like landing on an airplane at like midnight, getting into a rental car, and then realizing I got to drive an hour and a half to get to the hotel. And so I'm getting to the hotel like close to 2 a.m. And then I look at, well, when I got to get up and meet these people? Well, they want to meet at like 7 a.m. And so then I'm like having trouble sleep because I know, man, I got to be over there in like five hours. And it's a time zone change. I'm on the East Coast. I'm used to the West Coast. So 
this 2 a.m. is really like my 11 p.m. And just, man, the workouts got messed up. All right. But this is what I'm trying to share with you. It's kind of a workout. There's a lot of workouts you could do while on the road. Granted, you might not always have a pull-up bar. In fact, that's rare. But here's what you could do. Get a set of rings. You can find a tree anywhere to hang those rings from. All right, that's it. That's 50. I'm happy with that. I was just planning on doing 30. So now I'm just going to catch up with you guys. So the philosophy of my mentor, Scott Helvenston, he was all about not working out like with weights in a gym. He says, Chad, your body's your gym. And uh, this guy was in phenomenal shape. He's a world champion an athlete. He's the fastest Navy SEAL in the SEAL training obstacle course. I mean, every Navy SEAL that I ever met that knew him in the teams, that's like the one thing that they would go to so quickly. It's like Scott. They'd call him Scotty. I said, that guy was, uh, he was a beast. Phenomenal athlete. I mean, this guy, he was in the league of his own by far. And he didn't touch weights. I remember he took me to a gym one time just to show me that he could, you know, he still has it. Uh, but he was all about body weight exercises, pull-ups, push-ups, dips, um, you know, you name it in terms of calisthenics and the running. My hands are shaking, so let me try and set this thing up. So if you guys are just tuning in, I'm wrapping up doing a, a pull-up push-up routine where you do three pull-ups and ten push-ups every minute on the minute. Um, and you can play with those numbers. But I did that for 50 minutes. So it turned out to be 500 push-ups. And 150 pull-ups and uh, yesterday I knocked out 120 pull-ups and that's the first set of pull-ups I'd done in like a month um, so I'm pretty surprised that I hung in there I did okay on the pull-ups obviously I want those numbers to go up though right uh, those are not numbers to brag about but I'm just trying to be ah, stoned I'm just trying to be uh, open with you guys right I'm just trying to give you guys some tips and so if you're getting ready to go into seal training the reason that this stuff is important is because, look, you're not going to quit in a pull-up or push-up routine in SEAL training. You're not going to. Uh, it's going to happen on a run or a swim for those that do quit. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to get as good as you can at calisthenics so that when you go straight from the grinder into some long run, you're not already hurting. You're not already in that, that sort of red zone, that zone of suffering, uh, there's guys that are, they suffer all the way through buds. Like everything we did was suffering for them. And some of them made it, but man, they had a way more miserable experience in buds. A lot of them didn't make it because they suffered a whole lot more than anybody else did. The suffering is not all equal in buds. Everyone will suffer. It's equal in that sense. We will eventually get there, uh, but the suffering is not equal. And so you want to minimize those times that you go into what I would call that red zone, that zone of suffering. A lot of the workouts we did in buds, honestly, I'm not trying to be, be bragging right now. It was because of prior preparation. I give all the credit to my mentor, but a lot of the workouts we did in buds were a breeze. They were a breeze. I was in the top three on the runs, top three, you know, on those swims. The grinder workouts were nothing compared to what I did with Scott. Did I suffer in buds? Absolutely, man. Like there were some runs that definitely did get to me. There's some times under the logs, under the boats, like it got to me. Um, but in the surf tortures, oh man. But uh, there's things that you could do in terms of prior preparation that make it so that you don't have to suffer quite as much, quite as often as a lot of other guys do. And, uh, and that's why these pull-ups and push-ups, you know, and, uh, you know, even body weight squats, like this type of stuff is important, long grinding workouts. So uh, yeah, I just wrapped up 50 minutes of it, every minute on the minute, 500 and 150, uh, 500 push-ups, 150 pull-ups. And those numbers will go up. That was just sort of like, I figured I could do that, figure out where I'm at. Next time around, I'll probably do four pull-ups every minute on the minute. And I'll probably just go ahead and jump to 15 push-ups. Those push-ups are actually pretty easy. Um, let's see where we're at here, comment-wise. Best resource for presuppositional apologetics. It's been a while, so... The book that introduced me to presuppositional apologetics was, I think it was called something like 
the ultimate proof of God's existence. I know the name was Jason Lyle, and the way that you spell his last name is uh, L-I-S-L-E. That's a great like introductory resource to presuppositional apologetics. But I don't think that presup is the end-all be-all. That's where I think some guys go wrong. Man, they go wrong big time, in my opinion, in that area. They think that this is the only God glorifying, you know, apologetic, and this is the only way to do things. Like, I'm sorry, I honestly cannot picture the apostles in the early church running around asking people. And I've done this. I think it has a place, but it's not all the time. Like, I can't picture the apostles like running around asking people, like, how much does logic weigh? You know, is logic timeless and spaceless? If I pulled five pounds of logic out of the refrigerator, like, what would it look like? Uh, you know, or, you know, I, I get into that stuff, right? It, it's, a, it's a good apologetic, but it's like, it's not the only way to do things. All the time in the New Testament, I see them providing evidences, right? Jesus provided evidences. You know, when they asked Jesus, when they asked, when, so when the, uh, when John the Baptist, he sent some messengers to Jesus asking like Jesus, like, are you the Messiah? Like, are you the one or should we look for another? What did Jesus provide? right? He didn't, he didn't say like, you know, you can't question me. I'm the ultimate authority. You know, no, he tells him, you know, tell John, you know, that the blind see the, the deaf hear, the lame, you know, are, are healed. And, and so these were all evidences that Jesus provided. Jesus provided evidences. Uh, even um, the apostle Paul on Mars Hill, you know, he appealed to creation. Um, he appeals to creation in Romans since the creation of the world is invisible attributes are clearly seen and understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that every man is without excuse. This is an argument on the basis of, you know, evidence. And so I'm not like anti-evidence. And I think that a lot of presuppositional apologetics, they're very much like anti-evidence. So I kind of ranted on that a little bit. A lot of that stuff is going to be completely foreign (laughs) to, you know, these guys tuning in looking for a seal workout. Um, Adam Brown had the favor of God. Yeah, I'd say so. Adam Brown was a Christian and that's probably the best Navy SEAL book. I'll flat out say that, uh, his book, fearless Adam Brown's life story, everybody tuning in, anyone that wants to be a, a SEAL or just anybody should read that book. That, that guy's life is, is remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. You guys got any more questions, any workout questions? Hey, movie dude, 22. I just saw your comment about, you know, I get it, you know, struggling to read the Bible, struggling to pray, struggling to get out there and share your faith. But here's the thing, man. You just, you got to do it. Just take that first step. Maybe you're building it up to be something way bigger than it is, right? Maybe it's like so big. It's like, oh, it's overwhelming. You're thinking of all these things that, you know, you should be where you ought to be, how maybe you've been a believer for so long and you just feel like you're so far off the path and there's people ahead of you and you're starting to get like this overwhelmed mentality where it's just like you feel like, oh, it's pointless, it's hopeless. That's not the case. That's not the case whatsoever. Look at the prodigal son. I mean, that guy went off into some wasteful living, right? Um, he really he really blew uh, the fortune that he had before. But as soon as he came back, what happened? You know, there's a, a robe put right around him. Or think about Peter. You know, Peter in the New Testament, this is a guy that was like in Jesus' inner circle, right? This is the guy that says, you know, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. And so he was so close with Jesus. He was in that, like, that, that top three group. And uh, on the other hand, you know, he had blown so much where Jesus was calling him Satan. Like, get behind me, Satan. Um, and then that night, you know, when Jesus was in his greatest hour of need and people were he was telling the guys like, Hey man, come on, don't fall asleep. You know, stay awake, pray with me. And, and Peter's telling him like these others, they might, they might leave you. They might forsake you, but I'll never leave you. Sorry. I'm just walking along here right now. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Okay. I'm in the pool area. Um, but consider this, you know, Peter emphatically claimed like, Lord, I'll never deny you. And then what does he do? He flat out denies him. In, in Jesus' greatest night of need. And uh, not only did he deny him three times, but Jesus locked eyes with him after he denied him. Could you imagine that what that would be like? Him denying Jesus, he actually cursed. He cursed so much like he didn't know him. So he denies Jesus and, and Jesus 
locked eyes with him. Like basically you just did what you said you would never do. Could you imagine what, what Peter felt like at that moment? I mean, he totally betrayed Jesus. And it says that he wept. He cried bitterly. I mean, it, it, it's hard to, you can almost kind of feel that emotion of what he must have been going through. And so after all that, man, I mean, just that, that's a big mistake right there. He really blew it big time, right? And none of us can say that we wouldn't blow it either. But we can definitely say, Peter, man, you, you blew it big time. And I'm sure at that point he felt so far from God. And uh, look at later, Jesus rises again from the dead. He conquers the grave. And then what happens after that? He has an encounter with Peter. And could you imagine what Peter must have felt like? Because he knows that the last time that he was, you know, with Jesus in his, you know, earthly body, uh, before he went up there on the cross, he denied him. He denied him three times. And now he has this very close face-to-face conversation with Jesus on the shoreline. And uh, that must have been tough. Of course, it's in the back of Peter's mind as he's looking at Jesus and, lo- and Jesus looking at him. You know, put yourself in Peter's shoes. He must have been thinking like, oh, what is he thinking about right now? You know, I hope he's not going back to that that night. And I'm sure he just felt so sick over that, the anxiety that would come from something like that. I mean, talk about a, a post-traumatic stress moment. And then Jesus looking at him and says, Peter, do you love me? And, and, and Peter's probably thinking, man, he's bringing it up. You know, he's going there right now. And, and so he's just saying, yes, yes, Lord, I love you. And he says it again, you know, do you love me? And he questions him three times, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. And then look at what Jesus does after that. Even though Peter completely blew it, look at what Jesus does after this. After he checks his heart, is your heart in the right place? And Peter's heart was in the right place. He did love Jesus. Jesus says, and go feed my sheep. That's incredible. I mean, Jesus immediately just like recommissions him, just like that. He doesn't say, Peter, look, man, you really messed up. You denied me. We're going to put you through a probational period. Um, It's going to be a long time before you can do anything for me or the kingdom. No, he doesn't do anything like that. He just checks his heart. He says, look, I know you blew it, man. Like you you blew it on the external. Like we do a lot of external things where we, we blow it. And the enemy of your soul wants nothing more than, than you to feel like you completely blew it. You shouldn't go near that cross. You shouldn't go near that altar of God. That's what the enemy wants. You know, but Jesus says, look, I knew, I know that you, you blew it, but I'm checking your heart. Is your heart loyal to me? You know, the scriptures say the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. You know, when you look at, at King David, he had a, a heart after God's own heart. You know, man looks at the exterior. They look at all the, the things that people do on the external side of things. Like it says in, I think it's 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, where it talks about how, you know, the people chose Saul. They chose Saul because they looked at this man, his stature. He was a specimen to be looked at. And God makes a point. He says, look, I don't look at man the same way that man looks at man at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. And that's why he chose David. That's why he chose Peter, even though Peter blew it so much. That's why he continued to use David, even after he committed adultery. After he repented of that, uh, then, you know, Nathan told him to get up, you know, get up and, uh, and serve the Lord. You know, those sins are behind you now. And so we just need to confront sin in our life if we have sinned against God. Uh, but don't feel like now you could just never serve God or you're so far from where you should have been or where you could be. Look at the prodigal son. Look at Peter. Look at all these people that just immediately they're told, get back up on your feet, David. Get out there and do it. And don't be overwhelmed by the task. Don't think there's just too much to do. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you make it through hell week? Sometimes it's just trying to get to that next piece of seaweed on the ground. And if you start thinking about, man, like four more days of this, the people that talked like that in hell week, like, I can't believe we got three more days to go. Those are the people that quit. You're looking way too far off into the future. That becomes way too overwhelming. The way that you do big tasks is you chunk them out. You break them down into bite-sized pieces. It's eating that elephant one bite at a time. It's as my uh, friend Richard says, you know, who's a a Marine combat veteran. He says, inches turn to miles. And that's so true. Inches, eventually, they do turn into miles, don't they? All right. So I kind of missed the comments there for a little bit. I hope that was of value. Do you find value in bench press or find that you prefer other messages to work chess? Sorry if this has been discussed prior. No. I haven't discussed this prior. Um, There's very little value, I would say, in bench. The greatest value is going to be in these bodyweight exercises. But 
a little bit of bench press, I believe, can sort of be like an accessory exercise that ultimately helps you out, you know, with push-ups. It totally depends on what your goal is. So I'm really focusing on people that are, are goal-oriented towards going to buds right now. And so if you're thinking about going into SEAL training, you need to kind of lay off the weights, right? Like there's so many guys that show up to SEAL training after doing like these bodybuilding routines off of, you know, bodybuilder.com and that did them no good. Those big muscles don't do nothing for them when they go to buds. So they, they totally hinder them. I shared a story about that yesterday about a guy that showed up with just these gigantic biceps and he's on the log with me and my, my boat crew. And I'm thinking, great, we got this guy, with these huge arms and he was nothing five minutes into it anymore. And so, you know, the bench press stuff, like, do I ever hop on a bench? Yeah. How often? Very rarely. And in what context? Well, if I'm focusing on, you know, doing a lot of push-ups, I might do like a hundred reps of like, uh, you know, lighter dumbbell bench type stuff. Um, I find that with like real heavy weightlifting, yeah, I do get like more maximal strength, uh, but I, I don't really have that endurance type of strength. And that's when I tend to get some type of nagging injury. You know, like that's when I get some kind of like pinch in my shoulder, you know. And so I haven't done like a barbell bench press in probably like two years. Um, but, you know, in these hotels from time to time, the heaviest their dumbbells ever go is 50 pounds. And you could rep out, you could rep out like 20 reps of, of with the 50s. At least, you know, I can. It's not, it's not a lot, you know. Um, so it's very light. And, uh, you know, I might throw that in there just to change it up because your body will get familiar towards you know, doing the same types of exercises. So I'm all about these body weight exercises, but finding different ways to do them. So instead of just doing, you know, like a, um, you know, regular push-ups, you know, you should switch it up and do some diamond push-ups. You should do some wide push-ups. And then you should kick your feet up on a medicine ball. Man, I love that, that instability, you know, doing push-ups on something like that. Um, a lot of times I'll travel with uh, Olympic rings and I can hang those things from almost anywhere and do all kinds of variations of, of push-ups uh, on those rings. And the more that I change it up, the more that I vary it, I notice like the most amount of improvement uh, when I do go back to say like regular push-ups. And so switching it up constantly because your body, it, it, it I think it's called like the law of accommodation. Your, your body will find a way to accommodate to the exercise that you're doing. Like eventually the benefits that you are gaining from a particular exercise, you will begin to not have those benefits anymore because your body just finds a way. It finds a way to cheat. It finds a way to get through it and do it. So yeah, if you guys are just tuning in, I wrapped up a little push-up pull-up workout that you could check out um, when the stream goes up. Let's see what other comments we got here. How often did you work out when you're in the SEAL teams? Did it increase when you're downrange? Um, I think that to some degree it did increase in terms of like just focused workouts. Like when I was downrange, uh, I was probably hitting the gym like two times a day. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, when we're training, we're so busy training that a lot of the training that you're doing is keeping you in pretty phenomenal shape. Uh, like I mentioned yesterday, I was a heavy guns guy. So I was carrying around either a Mark 46 or a Mark 48 and all the gear that goes with that. You're north of 100 extra pounds. Like when you have all that gear on, you're carrying around more than 100 pounds. And we're running around in the desert, you know, diving on the floor, getting up, shooting, moving, communicating, running around, just hustling constantly, um, doing that, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And that, that gets you in pretty dang good shape uh, right there. Uh, so... All right, movie dude, 22. I'm glad that was encouraging for you. And you know, that's what I'm here for. I just want to be of value to anyone that tunes in. We talk about anything in terms of physical preparation, mental toughness, and obviously the spiritual side. So you guys have any other questions that you might have about workouts? I'll tell you that I do these, you know, every minutes on the minutes. Um, I really like pyramid workouts as well. And so, you know, these workouts, I'm obviously doing a lot of workouts that work with what my situation is, which is a lot of travel. I can't always count on having a gym to go to, right? Uh, so, man, I love like a, a good push-up workout that I could do anywhere in, a, in an airport, in my hotel room. Um, so I like to do these pyramids. I like to hit somewhere around, somewhere between three and 500 push-ups like a day, ideally, like when I'm in that mode of working out. 
And so here's a good little push-up routine uh, that'll get you 400 push-ups. It's a pyramid. And all you do is you do one push-up, you get back up on your feet, shake it out, drop down, do two push-ups, stand up, shake it out, drop down, do three push-ups, stand up, shake it out. And I think that you see the pattern here. Then you do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Keep going up. Keep climbing that ladder till you do 20 push-ups. And then when you hit 20, that's the peak of the mountain. Then start heading back down. Then you do 19, and then 18, and then 17, and 16. And you keep working your way back down to one. If you go up to 20 and back down, that's 400 push-ups right there. And so boom, 400 push-ups. And then how might I knock out like the last 100? I like to do like odd push-ups at that point. You know, that's where I might, you know, grab, uh, you know, a medicine ball if I can get a hold of it or any kind of odd object. Like I want to try and do push-ups on that just to change it up, just to switch it up. So that's another great one. So I love that every minute's on the minutes and I love pyramids. And that's just stuff that, that Scott passed on to me. And this is stuff that works, right? Stuff that works. Hopefully the stream's still going smooth. I'm obviously on the uh, Wi-Fi for the airport. I have no idea. You guys can hear me okay. Now I got 23 of you, it says, that are tuned in here. Hopefully this was a value to you all. I'm out here in St. Louis right now. I'm gonna be speaking at a corporate event in just a little bit here. It's a Christmas party. And uh, this is a unique corporate event because unlike most of them where it might be like leadership Sorry, I lost the connection there for a second. Can you guys comment in the comment section? Let me know you're still there. If you still see me or hear me. Stream is buffering heavy. Sorry about that, guys. All right, you guys hear me? I'm trying to reconnect here. Okay, with regards to that natural speaker, no, I wasn't always a natural speaker. In fact, uh, you know, in a way I was like terrified of it, just like I know everybody else for the most part is. Public speaking is the number one fear, number one. And I think that there's a myriad of reasons for that, right? Uh, so I got that buffering thing going on again. So I have no idea if you guys can even see me or not. But I, I like to relate it to shooting a machine gun. I remember the first time I, I shot a machine gun, uh, I think it was, it was either Mark 46 or Mark 48, man, my hands are shaking as I'm picking up that weapon and loading that belt for the first time and, you know, picking it up and, and laying down rounds because this is something new. And, you know, at the same time, you got to help you respect. How comfortable you get with it, you know, finally got to a point where it just became an extension of my, my body. It's no longer a thing that, you know, stimulates me and a sort of excitement anymore. Um, it was very casual and that's where you want it to be. If you want to be. All right, I'm moving spots. Work them out. The hard, definitely surf tortures. Um, how I overcame it was totally my why. My why I wanted to be a SEAL. You got to have a good why. And that why ideally is multifaceted. It's not just for one reason. And it's not for the wrong reasons. And so my why was, you know, it was uh, at the time, really like a huge part of it was my mentor, Scott Helps, and my family. Those are the two like real big ones right there. My why today is those two things still um, with more emphasis on faith as well. You know, be a good soldier of Christ. All right, just working my way through the hotel here, trying to find a good spot. Nice little spot to lounge, maybe. Back to the norm, cool. Got stronger Wi-Fi here. I'm just trying to catch up on these comments. Yeah, I'll continue to do these live streams. Um, so the question is, what does it mean to embrace the suck? 
Um, you've seen a lot of Navy SEALs probably use that online. This guy says he's seen a Navy SEAL use it before. And so the idea behind that is um, just finding levity in the moment. Um, not trying to run away from, you know, suffering. Be that person that, you know, while you're suffering, not trying to like look for a way out, trying to find a way to escape, like find a way to live there. Find a way to embrace it. Like make it your home. Be comfortable there. There's a lot of guys that are just so uncomfortable in that realm of suffering. Um, but if you could be that guy that smiles at it, that winks at it, that can tell jokes, crack some jokes while you're suffering, that's what it means to embrace the suck. There's a lot of things that you do in SEAL training that, for lack of a better term, they suck, right? And so embrace it. Just embrace it, right? Don't be afraid of it. Welcome it with open arms, you know? When the instructors tell you to go hit the surf, you know, let your battle, let out a good battle cry and, and charge forward. Um, I remember at one point, a week, this is probably like the third night, maybe the fourth night. There's nobody left that's going to quit. Everybody there was there from that point forward. And you eventually do wind up with a product like that. Eventually, you do wind up with a product of guys in Hell Week. I know this from being on the other side, from being an instructor. You're left with a product of guys that no matter what you throw at them, they are not going to quit. And that's pretty cool to see that. Um, but I remember, you know, when our class is finally at that point and these instructors are trying to do things to us to, you know, get us to quit, um, to make us really feel the suffering, uh, we were just making fun of the instructors from the water. And it's funny because there's just nothing they could do. There's nothing they could do to get us to quit. It reminds me of that scene from Batman with the Joker uh, where, like, Batman's interrogating the Joker. I don't know if you guys know that scene or not. I'm, like, back up in my room now. Um, so Batman's interrogating the Joker. He's trying to find out where basically, like, the love of his life is at or whatever. And he's just beating the snot out of him, right? Just throwing him against the wall, pounding his face in. And, uh, and the Joker's laughing. He's just saying, there's, there's nothing you can do. And uh, that's where you get at some point during SEAL training, like when you're in Buds in Hell Week, you start to get that laugh inside as these instructors are trying to like get you to quit. You're laughing like, there's nothing you can do to get me to quit. But at the same time, you, you don't want to be a prideful, arrogant dude in the water because then they're just not going to like you as a human being. Um, but uh, you just you find some ways. To fight back a little bit, I guess you could say. Okay, that's a deep question. So what would I say to somebody that, did they say they're, they have any faith? They're not aspiring to be a Navy SEAL. What would you say to someone who isn't aspiring to be a SEAL, but suffers from depression close to 20 years and is looking to develop mental strength, faith, etc. That's a good question right there. Let me start with just the physical side of things, even though I think the spiritual part of it is way more important. I can speak from personal experience that, you know, when I go through phases of, of like not working out and getting in really bad shape, I feel like my attitude also suffers. Like I start getting this mentality of just, man, I feel like I'm walking through the dark lands. You know, it's not a good feeling at all. Uh, just started working out again in the, in the past two days, and I can't even tell you how much better I feel. And so there's definitely, like, a connection in terms of, like, your mind and body. And so, like, that's one of the big things I try and tap into there, is I don't think that that's, like, the singular answer, just start working out. But, man, I do believe that, like, getting outside, getting under the sun, that's one of the best antiseptics right there. Like getting outside, go adventure, you know, God's creation, just like, like be active, work out a little bit. The feeling afterwards, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of things, right? Uh, it's a little bit of endorphins. It's a little bit of just, maybe you got out like a little testosterone that needed to get out. Um, it just, it really calms the nerves and it also gives you a sense of accomplishment now, which is going to make you feel better mentally, right? Like I feel better now that I knocked out 500 push-ups and 150 pull-ups. I have this sense of like, okay, like I've got something done today and I've got something else to go do today, you know, later on. Like I would feel way worse about myself if all I do is just sit in my hotel room and do nothing but twiddle my thumbs until it's time. 
until it's time to like go hit the road and meet up with this this corporate group. And so like I started off my day going through Proverbs chapter seven. And it's real convenient with the Proverbs because there's basically a proverb for every day, right? Um, so I went through Proverbs chapter seven, and that usually leads me off somewhere else into the New Testament. So that's usually my starting point. It's like the proverb for the day. But then that like leads me to asking a question in my mind about one of those passages where I'll find the answer in a cross-reference that somehow wound me up over in, you know, Matthew chapter six, where I'm looking at Jesus talking about, you know, the lamp of the body is the eye. And if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And I was like kind of wondering, you know, I've gone over that passage many times. Like, you know, what, what does that mean right there? And so anyways, like all that to say, I start off with the scripture. Um, and there's just a, a cleansing about that. You know, as the proverb says, like bind God's word onto your heart. And that heart is like the whole being, especially in that Hebrew culture. So it means like just basically spend so much time with God's word, like bind it to your heart, bind it to your hands that it's literally like imprinted. It's tied to you, uh, that you're thinking about it. And as you think about God's word, here's what's going to happen to your mind. And this connects to the whole depression thing, I think, because a lot of people, they don't have any peace in their life. And I think one of the biggest reasons that stems from is because they have no peace with their creator. They feel like they've sep- they've been separated from the creator. That's a horrible feeling right there. And so as you bind God's word onto your heart, onto your mind, you're constantly thinking about it, consuming it. What happens is, is you're, you're so saturated in God's word that it literally begins to change the way that you think and the way that you look at things. And that, that brings about a peace that gives you peace with your creator. And so that's one of the things to really emphasize right there. I think it was Paul Bunyan that said that, you know, sin will keep you away from this Bible, but this Bible will keep you away from sin. And so just as you, if you want to develop physically speaking, what do you got to do? If your goal is to be stronger, you know what you need to do. You need to go put in the work. You need to go work out. Don't be overwhelmed by the thought of how many workouts is it going to take for me to finally hit this level of fitness. Just go do it. Just go get it started, right? And the same is true spiritually speaking. You know, if you know that you're not right spiritually speaking, like maybe you'd call yourself a child of God, but you haven't been praying. You haven't been getting into God's word. You haven't been faithful in fulfilling the Great Commission and doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know, you know what you're supposed to do. And just don't overwhelm yourself and just turn to miles. Just come up with a plan. And so that's a great starting point right there. Like there's so many different ways to carve it up. There's so many different plans on how you can go through the scriptures. But so many people just are always so consumed with, and I've even been there, like, what's the best one? What's the best program that I could do? And so you spend so much time just trying to figure out, like, what is the best program? And you can't find one that stands out as the very best. And you you spend so much time on that that you never even begin to move forward. And so I promise you, you will progress. Like doing something is better than doing nothing. So like, even if you don't know the best workout program to do, don't let that stop you from going into the gym and doing something, because I promise you doing something in the gym is going to be better than doing absolutely nothing. And the same is true spiritually speaking in terms of getting into God's word. And so here's a good starting point. Just start off with the proverb for the day, right? So Proverbs chapter seven, go there. And, uh, and that one's all about, uh, it's especially geared towards men. Obviously women can get some takeaways there. Uh, but it's it's the struggle of you know immorality in terms of sexual sin, and uh, the prior proverb to that Proverbs chapter six is along those lines as well. And so there's just these words of wisdom, and I'm telling you, these things will come back to you in your mind, like they will. Like as I read Proverbs chapter six, you know, yesterday that was on my mind for yesterday, you know, as I studied it, and it guards my mind away from bad things, like literally, you know, it's like. They say it's the second look, right? It's the second look that kills you. I'm telling you, God's word pops into the mind, that first look. And it's like, all right, it gives you the strength for the day. You know, the strength is in the Lord. And so, uh, yeah, make it a goal then. Just do the proverb of the day. And as soon as you come up to a point where, hey, I don't understand that part right there, then study that part. That's your part you're going to study. And guess what? That's going to take you to other places. It's going to take you across the Old Testament, into the New Testament, you jump in the New Testament, suddenly now you're in Matthew chapter six, you're wondering, you know, what does it really mean to be, you know, the lamp of the body is the eye. 
you know, and if your eye is good, like, what does that good mean? You know, and, um, whoa, flipping the phone around here. And so I actually learned some stuff today, um, about that passage. I've memorized that passage. I have it to memory, right? I've read that passage probably more than a few hundred times, I would say, um, especially while, you know, memorizing it. And I didn't really completely understand, you know, I kind of felt like, you know, yeah, like what have your eyes looking at? You know, it's, it's a window to your soul and it's things that you're letting in. So if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the darkness is in you, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Uh, when in reality, it's like, oh, I didn't notice that before. The context around that, it's all about money. It's all about money. And, uh, you know, having a good eye, I'm trying to remember the, the way to like really uh, phrase it. Uh, but having a good eye is a generous eye. And having a bad eye is an ungenerous eye. And so it's basically the difference between a good and a bad eye is uh, if you're a generous person or ungenerous person right there. So I, I didn't know that before. Um, and uh, the commentary that I was looking at for that, I think it was Preach the Word with uh, R. Kent Hughes. Uh, he backed that up with scripture. Other places that word good is used and how it is used, it's used in terms of generosity. And that, that was pretty interesting to me. I thought, originally I thought that, I think that's why I found myself going there to Matthew 6, 22. Uh, the question was, isn't it about sexual impurity? I originally thought that uh, because obviously your eyes are the window to your soul. The things that you're looking at um, you know, are going to have an effect, right? Uh, but if you look at the context of it, that's the thing. Um, it talks about, you know, how like prior to that, let me, let me pull it up. I think prior to that, it was talking about like how no one can serve two masters. Uh, for either what you will love the one and hate the other, or you'll despise the one and however it goes. I'm so much quicker at pulling up my Bible up on my phone. So I'm trying to, I got commentaries popped up on the iPad here. Just give me one sec. I, I definitely see the principle there in terms of dealing with sexual impurity, but um, that's definitely not what's being taught. Because if you look at the surrounding context of it, I'm pulling it up right now. It's all about money before and after it. it says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where no thief breaks in and steals. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. So a lamp is like a guiding light. You know, you would use a lamp, a little lamp to guide you, right? So the, the guide of the body, you know, is the eye. If therefore your eye is good and the idea behind that is generous, your whole body will be full of light. You're doing good deeds. This is good character. Uh, but if your eye is bad, if it's ungenerous, your whole body will be full of darkness, you know, that's like that, that Scrooge, that Scrooge right there, right? Just that ungenerous, rich person. That's a bad person. That if your eye is bad, ungenerous, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And that's just a paradoxical, paradoxical way of saying like, like what should be light inside of you is darkness. And how great is that? You know? And then it goes on to say, right? So that's the end of that part. And then it goes on to say, no one can serve two masters. And again, this is talking about, you know, wealth or God. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot love God and money. And so remember just prior before that too, it says where your heart is there, your treasure will be also. So the thing that you love, you know, the love of money is the root of evil. It's not that money is the root of evil, but it's the love of money. If you love money, your love for money like outweighs your love for God, oh yeah, you're not serving God and you've made money, you know, your your idol. And so you cannot serve God and money at the same time. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And go fact check it, check it out. Um, it's that Greek word, that Greek word that's used for if your eye is good. The Greek word used for good right there is also used. Um, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's used as generous. 
Um, and there's a lot of cross references that R. Kent Hughes used for that. Uh, this is kind of funny though, how this stream goes from like a every minute on the minute workout stream to it's good though. Right. So it's, it's all goes back to that question though, about, you know, if you're having a hard time getting into reading the Bible, praying again, you feel depressed, you're not working out, like start off with baby steps and just turn to miles. So here's the plan. Do the proverb for the day. That's not too much to ask, right? It's, it's a very short chapter each time. It doesn't take you more than a minute and a half or two minutes to get through. And I think what will happen is you're not only going to read for a minute and a half or two. Don't feel so committed that, oh, man, I'm going to sit down for the next two hours here and study. That's what ultimately happened with me. I got sucked in. But hey, if I get sucked in, I enjoy it, right? Uh, but I'm not, so, I'm not going into this ahead of time thinking like, my butt is going to be in the seat for the next two hours. No, for all I know, I might only spend, you know, five minutes, five minutes. I wouldn't be too happy with myself, but that's all I spent. It never winds up that way. I'm just saying like, just, just get going. And what happens is you're going to get sucked into it. It's, it's a lot like a workout. A lot of times you just don't want to go work out, but once you get going, man, I'm happy. I'm here. I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to do a whole lot more that I originally intended on doing. So do the proper for the day. All right. And, uh, you know, maybe say a little prayer before you start, before you open up God's word, ask him to speak to you because these words will speak into your life. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, pray again. And what a difference, man. I'm telling you what a difference you will feel at the end of doing just that right there. I have never once and I've never met anybody that ever regretted spending a little time in God's word. It's crazy how we drag our feet to it. We do. We drag our feet to getting into God's word sometimes, but and we drag our feet to pray. But you'll never walk away from a prayer or from reading God's word and saying, man, that was a waste of time right there. Absolutely not. It's crazy. So that's part of the battle. That's part of the spiritual battle, I believe, right there. It's just like Paul Bunyan says. I think it's Paul Bunyan. I don't know. Correct me in the comment section. Somebody Google that. But I believe he's the one that talks about the Bible. He says this book, this Bible, you know, sin will keep you from this Bible, but this Bible will keep you from sin. And that is so true right there. And so once you spend a little bit of time in, in God's word like that and you start going down uh, those trails, uh, those, those trails that it takes you towards, you know, you start getting into the New Testament and studying, you begin to develop uh, spiritually speaking. This is your spiritual discipline. This is your spiritual workout. You're becoming spiritually tougher. Um, you're more prepared to be a good representative of God. You have that opportunity then to speak into people's lives. Uh, God teaches you these, these lessons, and then you get to pass these lessons on to other people. And it's all about making a difference for the kingdom. And I want to speak to young men you know, right now as I, I think about how just it's crazy how our culture uh, is trying to make you know, men you know, effeminate. They're trying to make dad to be the fool, and they try and you know, imply that you know, putting on your sister's skin-tight jeans, like that's cool right there. And you know, just like destroying manhood. And guys are just like settling for, you know, being 30 years old and living in their, their parents' basement, sitting on the couch and, and playing video games. And, you know, it's ridiculous because you're playing an imaginary game. You're fighting in an imaginary kingdom. And at the end of the day, like you didn't actually accomplish anything. You didn't do anything good at all. It was all fake. It was all make-believe. It's a video game. When in reality, you could be unplugging those electronics, getting off that couch, going out there and really fighting for a real kingdom, making a real difference. Getting out underneath that sun, that sunlight, like I said, it's the greatest antiseptic, right? And so, you know, we're only here for a little bit on earth. We, we have a very small amount of time and nobody's tomorrow is ever promised to them. And I, I do believe that the greatest regrets that we will have is, is going to be, you know, seeing how there's so much more that we could have done and should have done for the sake of God's kingdom. And we didn't do it. We spent it on self-improvement. You know, um, and that doesn't imply that, you know, doing things like working out, which might be considered in some people's minds like self-improvement because to some degree it is. That doesn't imply that that's bad because it actually does say in the Bible, you know, this body, we're supposed to take care of it. It's the temple of God. Right. Um, that bodily exercise does profit a little. Right. But spiritual exercise, man, that's the good stuff. That's the good stuff right there. So hopefully that helped out a little bit. Obviously, I'm not like a Christian clinical you know, psychologist, and there's like all kinds of, you know, deep issues sometimes that I don't know, but I could speak from personal experience. I've, I've kind of felt like I've walked around in those dark lands a little bit, you know, even up until, you know, recently. 
And I feel like a lot of that was connected, like what was going on in my mind was very much connected with what's going on, you know, with my body. I was like really getting out of shape and just feeling not good. It was doing things, you know, to my mind, to my spirit. Um, and so just working out again, just these past two days has really just like really cleared me, cleared me up quite a bit. I'm not in the dark lands walking around, you know, anymore. So that's my suggestion to anyone, um, that feels like they're going through that. And, uh, just start, man. Just start taking some steps. Let's see. We got any other questions here? Ah, <laughs> so I was quoting. I was quoting Paul Bunyan. I'm glad somebody checked that for me. I was saying Paul Bunyan was the one that says that sin will keep you from this Bible. This Bible will keep you from sin. That's the guy at the lumberjack, right? It's not Paul Bunyan. It was John Bunyan. Thank you. Thank you because you saved me because I might have like said that from stage in front of a lot of people. <laughs> uh, I haven't done that yet, but uh, if I kept going down that path of thinking the name was Paul Bunyan, I w and I'm probably still going to do it. I'm going to get it mixed up now. Um, my favorite Bible verse is probably John fifteen thirteen, And the reason why, well, first of all, it says, greater love has no one than this, one that lays on his life for his friends. And uh, that's my favorite Bible verse because it has a lot of double significance in my mind. I think of, first of all, uh, just soldiers that have shed their blood for the sake of our earthly freedoms. They're an example of those words, greater love has no one than this, one that lays on his life for his friends. And then I think about the significance behind that of with Jesus, how he shed his blood for freedom. Not for earthly freedom, but for eternal freedom. And so these guys, these soldiers, they shed their blood for earthly freedom. Jesus shed his blood for our eternal freedom. And uh, I just see the double significance in that, you know, the horizontal and vertical relationship that that has. Greater love is known than this one that leads us life for his friends. Probably got to get going in just a little bit here, but um, I don't mind keeping the stream going. I've We've got about 30 minutes. We can end this now or we can keep going if you guys got any questions. Uh, yeah, Mad Max, you wrote that I'm a Christian but haven't been to church in years. Maybe I need to reevaluate. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Get to church. But, you know, start now. You know, maybe you need to tune out of this stream and just go hop into that. Proverbs chapter 7 and go from there. Pray, read God's word. Movie montage. Hey, no, thank you. You know, appreciate it. I loved, you know, serving, especially looking back, like in the rear view mirror of time. It's like, man, that went by fast. And, uh, you know, it's an honor. And, you know, all the honor really goes towards guys that have sacrificed and like, like literally, you know, didn't come home the same or didn't come home at all and so uh i mean my thankfulness goes towards them so i feel like it was a it was a it was a privilege you know getting to serve in the military that's what it is it's a privilege you know plus you you, you get paid money to do what i think is a pretty fun job you know you get paid money to shoot guns blow things up jump out of airplanes hunt down bad guys and make a difference in the world. Let's see other questions we got going here. Do I regret leaving the teams? No, it's God's timing. I certainly miss it, but you can't have the best of both worlds, you know, all the time. And so it was time for a change. There's a there's a time, there's a season for everything, and uh, it was time for me to get out and get involved in full time ministry. No question about that. Uh, you know, you can't always have your cake and eat it too. You know, now I'm fulfilling that mission and I would never trade it for anything, but I'm a married man. I have children and, uh, you know, it's like you have other responsibilities, right? It's all about prioritizing, you know, your life. And so being in the SEAL teams, I do believe is a young man's game. It's a young man's game. And, uh, if you have a family and there's guys that have families that are in the teams and I don't know how they do it. You know, I know that it, it's a sacrifice for the whole family. That's the thing. And so now dad, you know, he has to really take into consideration what he is doing, you know, which is honorable. It's for his country and it's for his family. But at the same time, 
you know, his family is sacrificing as well. I think that's something that the whole family has to work out together. And so it's no longer like a decision just for, you know, dad to make. Because, you know, when you're a young single guy, the decisions that you make, they only have an impact and effect on on you. When I wasn't a married man, I didn't have a wife that I had responsibility towards. I didn't have children I had responsibility towards. And if I died on the battlefield, hey, I was straight with God. That'd be really sad for my parents to have to, you know, bury a son. Like nobody should ever have to do something like that. But it was like the the impact, right? Like there weren't literally people that were relying on me to support them and take care of them. That's scary. That's a scary thing. Like I would feel different on the battlefield now, you know, like knowing that I have a wife and kids at home. That's crazy. Like if I don't come home, who's going to take care of my wife? Who's going to take care of my kids? Like that's, I don't know. Like that's just, that's crazy. And so here's the thing. I think there's plenty of young guys that are willing to step up to the plate. There's plenty of of next guys, like the young next team, you know, members that are willing to take those reins. And it's like, man, you know, sometimes it's, it's time for a new season of life. You know, you spent some time being in the SEAL teams. Now be a great husband. You know, not be a great father. And so obviously it's a very personal decision people have to make, but that's the conclusion that I came to. Um, that I want to serve the Lord and I want to be I want to be there for my wife, you know, and I want to be there for my future kids. Uh, do you think that the end times tribulation is near with all the wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes? I mean, I could easily truthfully say we're closer now than we ever have been. That's a fact. It's crazy. Just like the technology of weapons now. Look at drones. Like, look, what could be done with a drone now? That's scary. How, you know, not only can drones, and I'm talking about little drones that get launched by people, you know, not just like the real cutting edge stuff that we have where we can launch from the skies, but look how like ISIS could go buy a drone on Amazon now and go hook up, you know, some explosives to it and fly it over the top you know, of, uh, you know, some troops or neighborhood and, 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 and drop a bomb like that. And, uh, and look how, you know, I'm just like an Amazon package could be delivered by a drone. Imagine all the different types of awful packages that could be delivered, you know, from something like that. And so that's crazy. Just like how that technology is getting into the hands of, you know, not just the common man, but, you know, in, into the hands of people that could be, motivated to commit acts of violence as well and so things are spinning uh pretty rapidly and then you look at you know where we're at morally speaking how there's like this gender confusion right it's like god made man and he made female and all of a sudden now we're we're telling people that you could decide if you're a man or not and you're telling little kids that are four or five years old that you know somehow they have the ability to make that decision and you're going to allow them to take some type of uh, testosterone blockers or some types of crazy hormones. It's like, this is, this is nuts where our, our culture is going right now. Um, it's toxic and we shouldn't be, you know, entertaining uh, this, this basically it's a type of mental illness, like genetically speaking, chromosome wise, like there's man and there's female. And you can't be having like this double talk and that type of philosophy, it totally like fires on itself. Right. Like when, you know, we, as a Christian, I believe in, uh, you know, the sanctity of life. And so women out there say, no, you know, it's pro-choice, pro-choice. And like, you know, just like the sound of choice and taking away people's choices. That sounds like such a bad thing to take away a person's choice of something. Right. But it's really just a bumper sticker slogan. It's, it's pro-choice, pro-choice for what? Like really get down to what are you choosing to do exactly? Cause I'm down for you to choose who you're going to marry. Absolutely. Choose who you want to vote for. Choose what school you want to go to. Choose what career path you want to take. But choose to murder? No. That's not a choice that's on the table, right? Like That's not even a, an option right there. And so throwing pro-choice in there, which could be a pro-choice for what school, pro-choice for who I marry, pro-choice, like throwing that in there and then all of a sudden extrapolating to the point of like murdering an unborn child? No. That shouldn't be a choice that's even on the table right there. But what I was going to say is like, you know, a lot of women, they say, you know, you, you have no right to say anything like that because you're a man. You can't speak to this issue. You're a man. And that's the genetic fallacy right there. I mean, literally, that's a logical fallacy to suggest that, you know, any statement of fact or truth that I make 
somehow has a gender connected to it, it shouldn't make a difference whether I'm a man or female. You need to take into consideration, you know, the statement that's being made, you know, whatever I'm trying to say it has nothing to do with whether I'm a man or female. But what if a man decides for that moment, since we're open to this whole pronoun thing and someone can choose what they are, you know, in the blink of an eye, uh, what if you say like, oh, you know, while I make these statements, um, I'm actually a woman at that moment, <laughs> you know? Like that's totally getting into the car of their worldview and just and, and crashing it on the roads of incoherence. Like that's their worldview right there. Anyways, I went on a little bit of a rant there. <laughs> Let me try and catch up with these comments. And saying stuff like that, you know, probably will cost me opportunities to speak at different corporate events, but I really don't mind, man. <clears throat> at these corporate events that I speak at, you know, typically they're inviting me to speak on, you know, something in terms of like leadership or, you know, safety. Obviously I can't, you know, be sharing the explicit gospel. It's not what I'm invited to do. So I'm, invited to provide a service. I get paid for it. This is kind of like my tent making, right? Um, I do have a way to bring in, you know, faith, but not like in a preachy way. I do it basically just talking about like a personal level of motivation. It's really not a thing that, you know, people find offensive. Um, but uh, yeah, saying stuff like this also could be a little costly, I realize, but I really don't mind because God makes it all right, you know? Like if this cost me in some way, you know, just coming out and saying that, you know, there's gender confusion out there, you know, that this whole like, like trans stuff is, is just like, it's, it's mental illness or saying that I'm, you know, pro, pro life, you know, rather than, you know, anti whatever. Are seals born or made? I'd say they're not born. I'd say they're forged. They're made. Absolutely. It's part of the seal creed. I talked about this a bit yesterday. It's the common man with uncommon desire to succeed. And so your DNA does not determine your destiny. Uh, you might come from quite the pedigree. Uh, you might, you know, just really come from, you know, a piece of cloth that's just different. Like that guy's cut from another piece of cloth that could get you only so far. You know, and the, the example I used was the, the, the toughest guy in my class. He, he had that DNA, man. There's never a question over who's going to get first. It was always that guy. Uh, you would think that he was born to be a Navy SEAL, but even though he's a very uncommon man, he had that extraordinary athleticism. He didn't have the mindset. And so in the SEAL teams, in the SEAL creed, it says it's the common man with uncommon desire to succeed. And that desire, that word desire right there, I mean, it has a lot to do with your heart, with your mind, you know, with your mental toughness. And you are not born with that. You know, that is something that is formed. Uh, that is something that just as you know, you have to put in the work to develop muscle. You have to put in the work to develop like mental toughness. And a lot of people, whether they like it or not, that work has been put in based off of the life that they, you know, grew up under, you know, based off of the deck of cards they've been dealt in life. You know, there's a lot of people that were just literally born into not becoming a Navy SEAL, but born into circumstances that lead to like that adversity that forges them to have that mindset to make it through SEAL training. And so you got to develop that desire, that heart, that mindset. And so, nope, SEALs are not born. I used to think that way. I used to think like, you either got it or you don't. I used to get so frustrated with people, especially when I got out of the military, when we'd be doing like hard workouts uh, together and, and just so many guys around me, like, like quitting during a workout, you know, when I was doing like high school ministry, I was trying to toughen up some of these guys and, um, you know, I just kind of like, I took the easy route. I just like, oh, you either got it or you don't, you know, it's just, it's a mindset when in reality, it's like, if I look back, it's like, no, it, it is a mindset, but it's not just a mindset you're born with. It's a mindset that is developed. 
And as I look back and reverse engineer, I can kind of I can see the things that led towards being able to develop, you know, that mindset. And so if it can be developed, then even if somebody doesn't have it, that means that they can work on it and develop it. Even if you're a 40, 56 year old person, it's never too late to start developing mental toughness. And I think that just like any other muscle that can atrophy, if you don't keep it up, I think that mental toughness can atrophy as well. Uh, you might be, you know, you might be mentally tough, make it through SEAL training, but all of a sudden, now that you've made it to the top, life gets easy. You start getting invited to like rub shoulders with the king. You're eating at the king's table from the silver platter. Man, you got the life that is just easy now, being fed by the golden spoon. And, you know, what it was like to endure adversity is like a distant memory. And suddenly, maybe years down the road, you get thrown into a situation where now you have to engage with that mental toughness. And what you find out is that muscle isn't there the same that it used to be. And so you have to constantly work on it. You got to keep it up. My favorite weapon in the SEALs, uh, probably that Mark 48 machine gun. Shoots a 7.62 millimeter belt fed. That thing is the weapon that everybody wants to have. Nobody wants to carry it around. But when you're in a gunfight, that's the weapon that everybody wants to have. Um, any podcasts that I listen to? I don't listen to any podcasts on a regular basis. I do catch like little snippets. Um, obviously, I don't condone everything that happens on a podcast, right? Like like language or substances that are being used. And where I'm going with this is uh, I probably – pop into Joe Rogan's podcast on a, on a similar regular basis based off of whoever the guest is. Um, so I'm interested in like the different guests, um, and their mindset. Uh, like I was very interested in when Elon Musk was on there, when Lance Armstrong was on there, when, um, here's a cool one. So Ben Shapiro just did a podcast with John MacArthur. Oh man, I'm going to go listen to that again and again and again. Um, so Ben Shapiro, he's, he's got some interesting guests. And so I'm more interested like in the guests that are on some of these programs and their perspective on things. I don't always find myself listening from beginning to end, you know, um, I'm usually catching like the highlights and, uh, if something about that highlight really caught my attention, you know, I like to maybe go back and listen a little bit more, uh, Jordan Peterson, very interesting character, um, on, uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. Um, Owen Benjamin didn't know that name until a couple of weeks ago. Pretty interesting guy. Um, there's definitely like dimensions about these people, uh, that I find interesting. I like, um, you just, you take the good and, uh, you know, you just, you filter out the rest. My favorite buds phase. Oh man, I can't make that decision right now. I kind of find them all equal in terms of my, my liking towards them for different reasons obviously you're doing different things any questions that are off limits uh, uh a couple funny questions that almost always get asked if i don't like head them off in the beginning whenever i do a q a like at a big place where there's like a bunch of people like hundreds or thousands of people if i do that open q a almost every time if i don't deal with this ahead of time i get asked these two questions it's crazy the one of them is can you tell me how many people you've killed the other one is, can you please share some of the secret operations that you've been on that you're not allowed to talk about? And so like those are, that's like a complete oxymoron right there. So usually if I just deal with those two ahead of time, like I just joke, you know, oh, you want to know how many people I've killed? Uh, well, I'd have to kill you to tell you. If you want to meet in the parking lot later, we could talk about it, right? Obviously that's not a real threat, but I got to mention that on YouTube. Um, and then the whole oxymoron of like, yeah, I've done some stuff that I can't talk about. I can't talk about it, right? So don't bother. Don't bother trying to get me to. <laughs> Any cool stories from Buds that wasn't in your book? Man, it's hard to remember what is in the book and what isn't in the book. So absolutely. Yeah, man, we had to, there was a lot that went on the, you know, on the cutting floor, uh, just because you, you don't want to, you don't want a super long book, man. You don't want to be going like over a hundred thousand words. 
otherwise people aren't really going to want they're not going to want to read it every now and then i think of like a story that didn't even get brought up though when i was talking about things uh you know with the guy that helped me write it uh right now nothing comes to mind but stuff that's popping in my mind uh, just based off of different phases or i remember a thing about hell week like hell week is crazy because a lot of hell week is a blur like a lot of hell week like there's just blank spots i remember a lot of the highlights like a lot of the mountain peaks um a lot of it was pretty fresh in my mind immediately following hell week like i could take you through each day um but then as like time went on it was weird just how like brain cells were like burned and like there's just there's these blank spots and so like i remember guys in our class would sit around and talk about uh we would talk about hell week and a guy would bring up a thing that you completely forgot about but as soon as you opened that door it like opened up a whole labyrinth of like other things now that you remember which is like it's crazy like so every now and then I'll get like a, a crazy memory, like during Hell Week um, that obviously didn't make it in the book. I can't like specify one right now, but maybe next live stream, you know, I'll have uh, a few of those. Uh, it's a hey-ho jump scary. No, not at all. I mean, there's no reason for that to be scary. You have very little free fall time. Sorry for shaking the camera. I'm just trying to, um, how about rude questions people have asked you over the years? I really should not ask this, but it's up to you if you want to answer. You should consider opening up a donation button so folks can donate, maybe. Somebody put what, ha uh ha. -huh. 30,000 feet in the air. Oh, well, here's the deal. I, I feel like, like a 1,500-foot jump would be way scarier than a 30,000-foot jump. The more, the higher you are, the more time you have to solve a problem if something happens. Like, there were static line jumps that I did in jump school. I don't know how low we were, but we were a lot lower than any free fall jump. It's like you look out that, uh, you look out the back of the C-130, and it's like crazy how the ground's right there. And you're like, this parachute better open up quick because I'm going to be on the ground real fast. So those lower jumps, you know, things get really scary once you get like, you know, you get like 300, 300, 500 feet off the ground. That's like some of the scary stuff, I believe, on a jump um, where all of a sudden your parachute starts acting weird and you're like 10 stories high. Like that's not where you want things to start acting weird. That's not where you want like your your shoot to suddenly start like folding in on a corner and like you suddenly just like, you know, gravity dropping, you know, like like 20 feet. Like what was that? You know, because if that happens, you know, any lower, like you're in big trouble. So stuff gets scary when you get lower to the ground. Dude, we've been going for 89 minutes and 40 seconds. So I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it a, uh, an hour and a half. I'm going to, um, get myself ready and get going over to this corporate event. It's been great hanging with you guys. Like I said, I'm going to be start, I'm going to start doing more of these, um, these live videos and we'll just see where they go. Kind of like the proverb seven thing, right? The proverb for the day, start off with a purpose and whatever direction it goes, it goes. All right, guys. All right. I got to go. So, uh, hope you guys have a great day. Hope this was beneficial to you all and I'll see you next time. Take care. God bless.